Right, a familiar, a familiar picture on, on the first screen here. Um, we're, we're really blessed to live in a country with a rich and diverse historic environment and a rich and diverse population of fellow residents. Um, and one of the most important manifestations of how different communities have shaped the country over the centuries is, of course, in our faith buildings. From our medieval cathedrals to Georgian synagogues, 19th century chapels and 20th century mosques and temples, to name a few, there is a bold architectural history of faith in this country. And one of the more fascinating architectural narratives, as we've discussed already a bit today, is when buildings house one or more different faiths over time. The planning system provides a, a framework for making, using and changing buildings, but buildings for faith are so much more than bricks and steel and stone and planning regulations. So how can we ensure that the values embedded in faith buildings are a part of the conversation too? And how can we give proper consideration to the values that minority faiths bring to buildings whose plan, fittings and architectural form were created by a different faith or perhaps in a different original purpose altogether? Historic England's conservation principles are one framework for encouraging the understanding of aesthetic, communal, evidential and historic value. And the interrogation of these values fully before considering change is, is what that encourages. Multiple narratives and historic values can really contribute to the interest of a place. And as I say, I will run through a few case studies now um, to show you this work in practice. Um, now, Historic England is, is deeply, committing to, deeply committed to recognising the value of diverse faiths, cultures and backgrounds in England's historic environment. And we want to fully ensure that the narrative we share about the historic environment includes all of this. In London in particular, latterly we've been demonstrating that the special character of the capital is firmly based in the diversity of its people and of its buildings. Um, this is all part of our, our campaign to, to influence the next London plan. And as part of this, the I Am London exhibition, which was displayed at King's Cross and also at City Hall, um, where we're trying to influence, as I say, the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, who incidentally is the first Muslim mayor of a major European capital, as we all know, trying to influence about the importance of heritage and character in shaping London's future. And I show you here one of the 60 portraits that was in that exhibition at City Hall. This is Dr. Nirav Amin, volunteer at Swami, Swami Marayan Mandir, popularly known as the Neesden Temple. The Mandir, or Hindu temple, is a traditional place of worship, um, Hindu worship, designed and constructed entirely according to ancient Vedic architectural texts and using no structural steel. It was built 1992 to 95 and is the, was the largest mandir when it was built and much of the marble was carved by Indian craftspeople and brought over as we saw an earlier, another example of earlier today. So it built in 1992, it's obviously too young to be listed and it's clearly beautifully looked after so it's not under any threat. But it's interesting to, to deposit whether in the future it might be a valuable addition to the National Heritage List to reflect its extraordinary craftsmanship and design. So perhaps, perhaps a question for, for future, for listers of the future. Um, we've already um, touched on this thanks to Shahed's narrative just there, but this is probably one of the most evocative and certainly the most extraordinarily diverse faith building in England. Um, we've, we've already rehearsed its history, but 1743, a Huguenot chapel, um, where French émigrés took root in, in Spitalfields from the late 17th century, later a Wesleyan chapel, used by the society, London Society for promoting Christianity amongst the Jews, then a Methodist chapel, and in 1897, as we heard, converted to a synagogue, the Great Spitalfields Great Synagogue, to a growing Jewish community in the area. In the 1970s, Spitalfields became home to a large Bangladeshi community who found work in the textiles trade, largely, and this building reopened in 76 as the London Jami Majid. Works took place in the following decade to remove internal galleries and do some internal remodelling, um, and it had been listed since 1950, so those works would have taken place um, under the sort of cloak of, of listing protection. Um, and at some point in the early 2000s, applications for minarets on the building first came in to Tower Hamlets, and they were turned down, as Shahed said, largely on heritage grounds for their impact on the, on the fabric of this grade two star list of building. They were directly attached. But in 2009, the um, application for the freestanding minaret-like structure um, designed by DGA architects was added to the Brick Lane frontage. Um, as we've heard, it was the cause of some controversy at the time, but Historic England and the London Borough of Tower Hamlets both supported it, um, both supported the application. 
design is inspired by traditional minarets, but its form and detailing are very different in a ground level, as we, as we can, well, we can't actually see, but as we heard earlier, um, it sort of enters, um, turns into a new entrance portal in the mosque. And I think it's a really elegant addition, and its freestanding nature is a testament to the possibility of altering historic buildings without actually affecting historic fabric. And 18th century fabric, of course, will have a higher age value than in more recent buildings. And I also think that its tall, kind of slender verticality forms a striking counterpoint to the mighty spire of um, Christchurch Spitalfield, which sort of holds court at the other end of Fournier Street. Um, and it's also architecturally announcing the presence of a thriving Muslim community. Now, one of the ways that we say um, what matters in architectural and historical terms is through listing, a practice which has just turned 70 years old. And we've been working hard as an organization to keep the National Heritage List up to date and ensure that the complex narratives and multiple histories that identify us as a nation are captured on the list as well. As I mentioned, listing colleagues, a couple in the room have been doing this work, have been looking closely at a number of faith building types following on from research from external experts and also from colleagues. Um, and we'll hear the results of these listing assessments um, directly from the minister at a press call tomorrow. And this, I must show you here, is one of the most extraordinarily beautiful and already listed um, faith buildings, the Shah Jahan Mosque in Woking, dates from 1894. Um, and it's of high significance as one of the first purpose-built mosques in Northern Europe and Britain. Sorry, 1888 it was built. Um, and was listed, sorry, that's right. It's built in 1888 and listed in 1984. So it's quite interesting it's been listed for such a long period at a grade two star. Um, the facilities of the mosque complex were expanded um, in the in 1990s by converting the former post-war um, warehouse buildings along the site boundary to provide additional prayer and education space. And this demonstrates one of the major architectural problems for mosque builders, making the mosque large enough for, for large and thriving congregations, but especially in this case, where the building originated from one extraordinary convert's great piety, whose ambition was to, perhaps to run a madrasa, but not a, a large and popular mosque. And it's an interesting question about adaptation of successful historic worship buildings when they need more space. In this case, how, what you, how you do that with a highly listed building. And that will, of course, have parallels elsewhere. Now, listing is about celebrating special architectural and historic interest. Oops, sorry, I've gone on too quickly. Go back. Um, but it also leads to the obligation to seek consent for changes that might um, impact this special interest. Extensions, or perhaps the adaptation of nearby or associated buildings, will have lesser impact on the, on the listed historic building itself but they might have an impact on setting and would therefore need to also be discussed with, with local planning authorities. Um, and any harm to significance, as Narita set out earlier on, will be weighed up against public benefit. And this is one of the sort of fundamental principles of the National Planning Policy Framework that, that guides all our work and that of, of colleagues in local authorities as well. Um, one of the mosques that's been under assessment for listing is this one of 1925 by the architect T.H. Mawson and Sons um, for the Ahmadiyya community in Southfields, along the borough of Wandsworth. Um, this handsome building, which you see here, and thanks to Luke for the photographs, it combines some decorative traditions of mosque architecture with, a strained, with restrained interwar British classicism. And you can see this, this dialogue throughout its architecture. It's the first purpose-built mosque in London and the only the second one in Britain. And it's also an important manifestation of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community's missionary activities in the early 20th century and has served as the international headquarters um, since 1984. And interestingly, um, the Ahmadiyya Muslim community has a practice, I think it's a really interesting one, of making a formal request on behalf of the caliph to the relevant religious authority. So, for example, a, a closed church would be to the relevant um, Church of England diocese for approval for change of use before purchasing the building. Um, and this will, they will only proceed with purchasing and then converting the building once they have written consent. And given the, the complexities involved, this seems to be really smart best practice and provide a degree of clarity within the planning system um, to allow it to work for changing needs over time. Um, now this extraordinary building, which you can see on, on the right here, is William Butterfield's parish school and church house, just off, just behind, just north of Oxford Circus. It was built in 1868, 
um, to serve the High Victorian Church across, just across Margaret Street, which itself marks such an important architectural moment in the early Gothic revival. And that both these buildings are listed at grade two star. It's um, often celebrated for its diaper work, brick and stone exterior. And the building has also been home of the Taiwanese temple and the International Buddhist Progress Society for over 25 years. It's an active center of British worship and teaching. And a few years ago, it became the first temple to receive a, a places of worship grant from the Heritage Lottery Fund. This substantial grant supported restoration works to the roof um, and high level masonry, and also promoted a program of activities um, and sort of open days and events and a, an exhibition at an archive, which many of you will know is often a requirement of, it is a requirement of HLF funding. Um, the building has been listed since the 1960s, but the interior was always fairly pain, plain, and it's described as such in the listing. Um, so unlike the sort of exuberant exterior, uh, interior of the Butterfield Church across the road, those of you who have seen it will know that it's the most remarkable brickwork and sculpture and glass. Um, the interior of this school was much plainer, but it's rather lovely, I think, to see the, the adaptations on the left there, the interior of the, of the monastery, bringing some of that exuberance um, to its sort of partner building across the road. Um, and I really, I love this example because it's so obviously still a very distinctive London fire station and it's sort of in the manner of Norman Shaw with its characterful roof, roofscape and those distinctive kind of wide appliance bays openings there on the ground floor. But the flags and the red and gold gate just to the return there announce it as something really quite different. Um, this building was fire damaged in the 1970s and then renovated by volunteers for its current use as a Buddhist center. And where the fire, fire engines were once housed, there is now a library, bookshop, and reception room with painted murals, as well as two ornate shrine rooms with Buddha figures. In the basement are new rooms for meditation and classes, and the upper floors house Buddhist residential communities. It's beautifully looked after, and it really does, I think, epitomize the very best of, of new life for listed buildings. You can so very much read the original purpose um, in the building but it's also been quite transformed for, for a vibrant community use. And this, this image on the right, you probably can't make out that nice kind of very distinctively architect-y late 70s writing there, but it's identifying, it's from the newsletters, it's identifying um, the changes that were to take place and it's, it's noting that the brickwork will be thoroughly restored. And you can, can see that um, in its current manifestation on the left. But it also talks about how the, the new use will take place um, for, by sort of opening up the ground floor completely. <coughs> Um, this early 19th century former synagogue in Bow, East London, was built as the Mile End and Bow District Synagogue in the early 19th century. It was listed in 1974 as a synagogue, and at that point, the frieze you see there under the pediment carried the name of the synagogue, um, but it was bought by the Sikh community in 1977, and it's intriguing that the frieze lettering now clearly announced it as the Gudwara Sikh Sangad. Um, and I asked, do we think there is a responsibility to tell the story of the original place of worship through interpretation boards or through the survival of original lettering or architectural features? Often these will be protected as part of the significance of a building. The justification of change to these features is one of the key issues, and as ever, as part of the planning process, will be decided on a case-by-case -case basis. That's the sort of fundamental premise of all of this. Um, but architectural and lettering layers can also demonstrate the vibrancy of a multicultural society. Um, and I'd also just like to say something briefly here about our sort of shared duty to keep the National Heritage List itself up to date. That's the, that's the public, the searchable database on which everything which is nationally protected sits. Um, and if you look up this building, as I was doing um, last night to get some good pictures of it, um, you'll, you'll only read it as a synagogue. There's no reference to its current use because it's been listed from before that time and there's no kind of obligation to update that as part of the planning process. Um, but very easily, anybody can register to update the list themselves. And I think it'd be really wonderful if we could all encourage um, ourselves and also um, minority faith groups to, to register and to add their own layer of history to the National Heritage List to, to say what this building is, is serving as now, add photographs, tell that story. Um, it's something that we can't do ourselves in Historic England. We really need people to contribute. Um, and that would be a really great way to sort of move these narratives forward. Um, this listed building in Nelson, Lancashire, was once the home of a historic textile factory. Um, and it then later turned into a pub, but it was closed in the early 90s and um, hit by vandalism in a series of fires. 
It's a really prominent building on the approach to Nelson. Um, and it was grant aided as part of an area grant scheme um, run by the Council on Historic England. And then also received some further grant aid in 2014 for its restoration by the UK Islamic Mission, Madina Majid Mosque from Nelson. Um, and they acquired this derelict site to house a new mosque and community centre in this mid-Victorian um, local textile owner's house. The repair work was part of the final improvements that allowed the entire conservation area to actually come off the Heritage at Risk Register. So not only was it um, dramatically improving the fortunes of this listed building, but it also contributed um, very positively to the character of the wider approach into Nelson. Um, Historic England was really pleased to invest about £250,000 to save the building um, and to help sort of facilitate its, its community, its reuse as a community centre um, for the, with the UK Islamic Mission. And it's very much, their, I understand, it's their intention to create a new mosque in the grounds um, and to sort of create a place where the community as a, as a whole can come, can come and relax. So it's a really lovely example of what we touched on earlier today about the role of, of new faith groups um, helping sort of, to sort of heroically transform um, derelict buildings and give them new uses that are benefit the wider community. Um, this is an unlisted heritage asset in Cornwall. It was built in 1906. Um, the nonconformist Quenchwell Chapel. Um, in 2000, by 2008, however, it was out of use and in a very bad state of repair. And it was bought by the Cornwall Islamic Trust um, and recently op opened as the only dedicated Islamic centre in Cornwall. It's a modest example and perhaps a usefully representative one, um, particularly as new faith communities settle and grow in numbers in parts of the country where they may have been much fewer in number historically. Um, the restoration and reuse of building types that were once ubiquitous, for example, you know, non-conformist chapels in Cornwall, um, that now themselves have decreasing congregations, means that this type of flexibility um, and sort of imaginative approaches to reuse is, is really welcome. And the website for the Cornwall Islamic Trust emphasizes that, and I quote, it's open to people of all faiths. We hope this will bring better understanding of each other's faiths and cultures and bring the local community closer together. We want our centre to be a source for social cohesion in Cornwall. Um, and I think this manifestation of diverse and unified communities can't really be any more important these days for all of us. And keeping the architectural character of an original building like this, but rescuing and bringing it up to date to new needs is a really important way of doing this. Um, this building dates from the 1870s in a lavish French Gothic revival style. It's in Leicester. It was in a very prominent location. Um, it's listed grade two star. But after the bank closed, it, was, um, it started to deteriorate and it was put on our heritage at risk register in 2011. Historic England and Leicester City Council supported proposals for conversion to a centre for the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. Um, and a number of repairs took place. Now, is ISCCON, um, is abbreviated, International Society for Christian Con Consciousness, received a Heritage Lottery Fund grant to restore the stained glass windows <coughs> in the main banking hall um, and have addressed a number of other of the repair needs themselves. However, there is identified as being quite considerable damage at roof level. Now, Historic England cannot grant aid places of worship currently, and most of the places of worship on our at-risk registers are historic parish churches under Church of England administration, with which, of course, we have much, inevitably, a much stronger and sort of long-standing understanding of organisational issues and structures. But we are, as an organisation, very keen and committed to engaging across the faith spectrum, of course, and we would like to engage and support other faith groups as they undertake heroic rescue projects and complicated projects just like this one. And working together and developing shared understanding is really important in this process. Grants inevitably require wider public benefits and community cohesion through enhanced understanding of different faiths can be an important way of, of identifying public benefit. Thinking about ways that the community can be brought together um, is, a, is a really key way of exploring this concept of public benefit, which the planning system recognises. Um, and it's really important in an increasingly competitive grants landscape to think really and, you know, closely about how we identify public benefit. Um, this is a, a case in Sunderland, a, a really interesting case, a, a parish church built in the 1860s with designs of James Murray from Coventry. It was listed at grade two in 1950. It was closed by the Church of England and bought by the Sunderland Sikh community as a place of worship. The building has suffered from condition issues um, and had a number of urgent repairs. 
Um, and this also had some funding from the HLF and from what we then had as a, a places of worship scheme ourselves. Um, the spire remains in urgent need of repair and there's been ongoing discussions. I'm not fully up to date with the latest on this. I know um, it just introduces a really interesting issue to raise here about um, the, the need for works to the spire, but I understand that the community using the building would rather replace it with a different architectural form, with a dome instead of a spire, in some way kind of re, you know, reform the architecture of the building as part of that process. The local authority is advocating for the repair of the spire. Of course, that was part of the original um, architectural design of the building and something that's quite noted as having as part of the list entry. Um, the building does retain an impressive set of, um, retain an impressive set of Victorian um, stained glass windows, a phrase of clear Christian iconography, and they've been retained um, by the Sikh community who use the building, again, in a really sort of popular way by drawing in the community to open days like you see on the right here. So it's just it's a really interesting issue about sort of architectural design and whether or not really quite major changes like that would ever be um, sort of allowed through the planning process if indeed that was the desires of the community who was who'd rescued the building and were using it. Um, nearing the end here, I just wanted to say a very quick word about places of burial, as there is a rich history um, of shared sacred space. Um, my own parish church, an Anglican church, St Pancras, was notable for having a number of Muslim burials in the 18th century, unusually. Um, so we can see this in, 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 in a number of different places. First to mind, of course, is 19th century Brookwood Cemetery, some of you may know, in Surrey, um, where the layout of paths and avenues of that original design allowed for um, a different number of London parishes, but also different religious denominations to be buried within Brookwood. I mean, it catered for all classes and for all faiths. Um, and that's not far from this site here, the remarkable Muslim burial ground in Woking. During the First World War, the incumbent imam of the Woking Mosque petitioned the UK government to grant nearby land to the mosque as a place of burial ground for Islam, Indian Muslim soldiers. And by 1917, this ground we see here had been constructed and received the bodies of 19 soldiers from the hospital for injured soldiers at Brighton Pavilion. Um, and it was, it's, listed, it's listed, um, listed and registered, the structures are listed and the site is registered as a landscape. And it was restored beautifully a few years ago, matching the original design. The brickwork had fallen into disrepair. Um, the bodies have been um, re moved to Brookwood. And this is now a garden of peace and remembrance. Um, the, this is the former Ace Cinema in Rainers Lane in North Harrow. It was designed by Frank Bromage in 1936. And it's a really exuberant Art Deco cinema. Um, it was listed at Grade 2 Star in 1986. But it fell out of use as a cinema around this time and became a nightclub and ended up, sadly, on our Heritage at Risk register. Um, the building was purchased by the Zoroastrian Trust Funds of Europe in 2000 to serve as a, um, as a place of worship and also their European headquarters. Um, and the building was converted around 2004 with large investment from the Zoroastrians themselves. And the building was absolutely beautifully restored. And you can see um, a few of those images here. It's a really straightforward case for us in Historic England. Obviously, we were consulted because it's listed a high grade two star. Um, but the very high level of heritage benefit that this conversion brought um, and the wonderful example of new use for a thriving minority faith group meant that the building came off the Heritage at Risk Register, which is an you know, extraordinary gain. And I, I show it to you. It came up a bit earlier um, with, with John's question. I think it's a really important point. This is a, a beautiful sort of exemplary conservation project. It's a really heroic rescue <coughs> of a building at risk. And it shows a sort of eminently suitable um, scale of these really large cinemas to um, thriving new faith groups. Um, and just to end now, perhaps one of the most prominent faith buildings in the capital um, is the London Central Mosque of 1970 to 77 by Frederick Gibbard. This has um, great symbolic interest as a role, as a landmark of the Muslim faith in Britain, and it's the only mosque to be built at a diplomatic level. Um, it's also a beautifully composed and finished example that combines the architectural traditions of British modernism and historic Islamic forms in a way that really effectively sort of illustrates the increasingly multicultural nature of British society. Um, it's a really, really striking building. Um, and we'll wait to see tomorrow what, what the minister has to say about that one. Um, so I started by asking how the values embedded in faith buildings can be a part of the planning conversation, how we can give proper consideration to the values that minority faiths bring, new, re new and reused buildings. 
Part of this is through the understanding of different cultures that grows through experience in multicultural society. And the examples that we've seen today form a body of experience and precedent that we can all learn from. And I think it'd be useful to think about how we at Historic England can start to draw some of these together onto web pages, for example. Listing is one way, but a really important way of capturing significance and encouraging a conversation in the planning system um, for the good of the building. Policy allows and professional approaches also allow us to think broadly about public benefit and how to encourage reuse, particularly for buildings at risk. Um, and there are some really heroic rescues going on with new faith communities taking closed buildings. Um, so how can we in public bodies and as practitioners support them with guidance and advice in what is a really like, complicated um, sort of grants landscape? Another question is how can we capture and retain multiple historical narratives in a building that has had multiple uses? What do we keep from earlier layers? Um, and how can we also think about ways of effectively taking on new layers for users, for new users? And what is the role of exceptional new design and the public benefit manifest through community cohesion um, that can help to mitigate this concept of harm that might be introduced by perhaps altering the fabric through, um, through changes that take place? So I hope that we can continue to draw on the examples we've discussed today um, and celebrate the significance of these really quite extraordinary buildings. Thank you.